a cruise on the Mikhail Lermitov will create memories that will last forever. Memories of romantic nights under the stars. With the relaxing sound of birds chirping in the background, you can meet with your friends and be served refreshments. The Mikhail Lermontov was a multi-million dollar luxury cruise ship, 12 decks high, it had an entertainment lounge, 5 bars, a swimming pool, a cinema, a gym, a disco, restaurants, various shops and a library. The ship was 25 years old at this point and had just received a 25 million dollar upgrade. It was originally an ocean liner owned by the Soviet Union built in 1972 and named after the Russian poet Mikhail Lermontov. The ship was originally used as an ocean liner on the Leningrad to New York run. However, the Soviet government realized that there was more money to be made by converting it to a cruise ship. The accommodation and facilities on board were significantly upgraded in 1982. The journey started in Sydney on the 6th of February 1986 for a two-week cruise. They visited Auckland and Tauranga on the North Island before arriving at the capital city of Wellington on the morning of Saturday the 15th of February. During the last stopover, the ship's pilot, Don Jameson, boarded the Lermontov. At midnight, she left the harbour for the Marlborough Sounds. For 16 years, Jameson was Marlborough's only highly experienced pilot. They were heading to the small town of Picton, a gateway to the South Island, before they were to set out in the open seas to Australia. They would arrive at Picton at around 6 in the morning. At around 12 p.m., the Lermontov crew were holding reception for the harbour board. Captain Don Jameson indulged in a few drinks while he waited for his wife to join him. Jameson had the luxury cabin organised for her. However, he would arrive on board alone. Shortly after 3 p.m., the Lermontov departed the port in Picton, carrying with it 743 souls. Captain Vorobyov and Don Jameson discussed the route they were to take, and Vorobyov placed his faith in Jameson. Just after leaving port, the Lermontov sailed dangerously close to shore. Jameson then assumed the character of a tour guide, talking into the loudspeakers, explaining the surrounding islands and the historical monuments. One historic site Jameson had planned on showing the passengers was a wrecked settler's ship named the Edwin Fox. As he was working to take the ship in for a closer look, Jameson slipped on the deck and fell, smacking his head while the ship was headed closer to shore. The vessel came as close as 30 metres from the shoreline before the crew managed to regain control and steer it out of harm's way. Ships departing from the port of Picton usually make for the widest possible channel towards more open waters. But Jameson was adamant on directing it into a smaller channel behind Allport's Island, requiring a hard right turn. For the third time in under an hour, the crew and passengers watched the ship narrowly miss the shoreline. A new shift of officers arrived, and Captain Vorobyov left his post briefly to shower and change. This left Chief Officer Sergei Stepanishev in command of the vessel. At 4.50pm, Jameson then pushed the ship to full cruising speed and headed for the open waters of the Cook Strait. The safest route for a large ship out of the Marlborough Sounds is to the seaward side of the Motuara Island. However, Jameson had other plans. He directed the Lermontov to sail between the island and the coast. Jameson was changing the course of the vessel every 10 to 15 minutes. The Cape Jackson Passage is a dangerous pass, plagued with shallow reefs and rock. At 5.21pm, Jameson gave orders to change course. 
The ship was now headed directly towards the lighthouse which marked the Jackson Passage. As the ship was headed towards a body of water which looked like a clear passage, Jameson was observed leaning with his head on the wall. Three minutes later, it struck the shallow rock. The Lermontov was incredibly unlucky. It could have missed the sharp rocks by around four meters. Instead, the hull was shredded by it. Water began flooding into the vessel, and Jameson ordered to turn left, intending to land the ship on the shore. Captain Vorobyov came racing back to regain control of the ship. Jameson held his head in his hands. Vorobyov found it was far too late. The ship was fatally damaged. All the watertight doors slammed shut. The Lermontov had claimed its first victim. Pavel Zaglia Diamov, refrigeration engineer, was working deep in the hull when the walls ripped open, flooding the compartment in seconds. While the disaster was unfolding, passengers continued their vodka and Russian wine tasting and dancing as the band played. The Lermontov began to list and the crew knew that it would eventually sink. Water began to come through the lift wells and the ventilators. It cut off the technical equipment which affected the balance of the vessel. 40 minutes after striking the rocks, Captain Vorobyov asked Jameson to direct the ship to a safe beach. Jameson then radioed for help. A ship, Tarahiko, was listening into the distress call. They set out to help the Lermontov immediately. Also close by was the inter-islander ferry Arahura listening in to the distress call. As rescue coordinators were under the impression that the Lermontov was sailing to shore, they called off both rescue ships. Thankfully, both the Arahura and the Tarahiko ignored the message. Meanwhile, Wellington Radio took a message from Jameson stating the following. The master says he does not require assistance. Jameson and Vorobyov still dispute who was responsible for cancelling the May Day. The Lermontov began drifting towards Port Gore, a bay and natural harbour in the Marlborough Sounds. A voice came over the loudspeaker saying, Ladies, Ladies and, gentlemen, and gentlemen, there is, there is nothing, nothing to be alarmed, to be alarmed about. about. It should have taken the Lermontov about half an hour to shore, but it was taking on water at an alarming rate. Around 7.15pm, the ship's power was cut off and the engines were drowned, meaning it no longer had enough momentum to get to shore. Vorobyov then gave the order to abandon ship. As the first lifeboat went towards the shore, they realised it was far too rocky and dangerous, so they returned to the Lermontov. It was now around 8pm and the weather was beginning to turn. Jameson continued to downplay the situation. It was soon chaos. Passengers scrambled for their belongings and threw on life jackets. Now around 9pm, the Arahura was still around 30 minutes away. It was dark and getting the passengers down a few decks to the lifeboats was a nightmare for the crew. The average age for the passengers was 70. As if it couldn't get any worse, all the lights went out. The power was cut, and now it was pitch black. At around 9.30pm, 23 small vessels had arrived and were patrolling the area in the gathering darkness, shining lights on the Lermontov. At 9.35pm, the Arahura arrived and took on board as many passengers as it could. At 10.20pm, the Navy ship Topor arrived. It sent out a dinghy and began assisting with the rescue. The Lermontov was now listing too quickly to load more lifeboats. Instead, they had to climb down a rope ladder down the side of the ship. The listing continued and eventually the rope had not enough length, leaving passengers no choice but to jump. Having all passengers on board lifeboats and rescue vessels, Captain Vorobyov was dressed immaculately in his uniform and was the last to leave the Lermontov on a motorboat. 
Shortly afterwards, the ship began to rapidly sink on a steep angle to the right side. The crashing and hissing of the Lermontov was deafening. It then vanished completely and the $100 million luxurious liner rested on the sea floor. At 5am, the passengers disembarked in Wellington. With some broken bones and some cases of hypothermia, 742 of 743 were remarkably saved. Jameson was whisked away by his union when he disembarked in Wellington unnoticed and slipped out of sight from the Russian guards. The New Zealand government were not in the dark as to why the Lermontov sank. An inquiry was launched with Captain Steve Ponsford in charge. The inquiry has been highly controversial. For starters, Steve Ponsford was a close friend of Jameson's. Of course, those involved in the wider public expected legal action or some form of punishment. However, Captain Ponsford advised against it. The findings of the report were then announced to journalists. The announcement was not well received when the news broke that the government had dropped the matter. The inquiry showed Jameson stating that he ordered port 10 degrees and that the order was not questioned. However, Russian crew gave evidence that they did indeed challenge Jameson's order. The Russian crew were in an incredibly hard situation. While they sensed something was wrong, they knew it would not look good at all if Jameson was indeed correct. If the Russians sent the ship to ultimately crash somewhere else, disregarding the pilot's orders, that would have been the end of them. Another point of contention was alcohol. We know Jameson drank three drinks at the reception before the Lumentov's last cruise. It was later found that he had one beer and two vodkas. In interviews, Jameson asserted that he made a sudden decision to take the narrow passage. He claimed he was fatigued. He said the only explanation he could offer is that he had been suffering from mental and physical exhaustion. His diary supported his statement showing an average of 70 hours a week of work over the months prior. Australian lawyers dug deeper and found Jameson had not been working the hours he claimed in the month and a half prior. He had an 11 day break through January and February, although he did work long hours the week before piloting the Lermontov. It was later discovered that the Lermontov could have cleared the passage if it was high tide in a depth of 8 metres of water. Most theorised that Jameson was simply showing off, trying to prove the passage was possible and make a name for himself. No action was taken against Jameson, but the Soviet government launched their own inquiry. The Russians found Jameson was indeed at fault, but they could not punish him, so they turned to the crew for someone to blame. Chief Officer Sergei Stepanishev was sent to prison for four years and fined $70,000. The Soviets said he was at fault for not overruling Jameson's orders. Captain Vorobyov was punished and demoted to a desk job. The Baltic Shipping Company was still missing $100 million. The government salvaged the wreck, recovering and selling valuables, as well as emptying the fuel tanks. The Russians hired Australian lawyers to sue the Marlborough Harbour Board. Jameson refused to appear. The board would later pay $4.6 million to the Russians. Australian passengers later went on to sue for another $3 million. Jameson surrendered his pilot's licence and the Marlborough Harbour Board was dissolved five years later. Scuba divers have taken most valuables and treasure that could be carried and three divers have sadly lost their lives in the claustrophobia-inducing mazes of giant staircases and dark corridors. Diving the wreck is incredibly dangerous. Because the Lermontov is lying on her side, there was a lot of structural deterioration after sinking. Walls and partitions were collapsing. There were also numerous sliding doors rotting away. Divers could so much as touch a door and it might slam shut, trapping them inside. Only two of the bodies have since been recovered. Russian President Boris Yeltsin 
once described New Zealand as the only country ever to sink a Russian ship and get away with it. Jameson has never broken his silence. He later reapplied for his pilot's license, which was accepted and worked for straight shipping for 10 years before his retirement in 2001. The luxurious Mikhail Lermontov lies on the seabed at Port Gore to this day, submerged in around 30 metres of water. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.